You can now order Dr. Larry Whitman's book, Max Out Mindset. Go to performancemountain.com backslash max out mindset. The link is in the show notes also. At Performance Mountain, we've worked our entire lives to be elite in every sector. Now we try to give back. At Performance Mountain, we empower teams and groups to maximize potential, minimize friction points between groups of people, communicate at the speed of trust, and optimize performance when it matters most. Check us out at performancemountain.com. You are listening to Max Out Mindset with your host, Dr. Larry Widman, performance psychiatrist and elite mindset coach to women in sports, business, and life. Welcome to the Max Out Mindset podcast. This is your host, Dr. Larry Woodman, sometimes known as Doc in the Mindset World. I always say that I do this podcast because I've been blessed over the last 20 years to work with some of the best teams, athletes, coaches, businesses in the country, and I like to share what I've learned from them. And of course, when I have a guest on, learn what uh, they've what they've learned over their lifetime about what it takes to be great. I say my definition of maxing out is given the talent, the experience of the athletes, coaches, the depth, the health, and the intangibles. Can the team reach the limits of their capabilities? And then can they do it under pressure when it matters the most? Because I always say, if you can't do it when it matters, what's the point? So today I'm really lucky to have a former high level athlete and current coach on the podcast. She's entering her 17th season uh, as a coach uh, for a particular school, but has coached, I think, for 20 years. Her record at her current school, Bellevue University, 454 and 177. Lifetime, 578 and 198 with a winning percentage of about 75%. She's fifth among active NIA coaches in win percentage. Ninth in overall wins of 578. Last year, her team reached the quarterfinals for the first time since 2000 with a ranking in the top 10, finishing, I believe, at number eight or number nine. Prior to this, she was a great athlete at College of St. Mary's. She was the MCAC Player of the Year. I don't know if I'll say the year. I'll let her decide what year that was back in the 1990s. She also has three kids. She's also an assistant athletic director. Uh, welcome to the Max Out Mindset podcast, Coach Trish Sedlick. Thanks, Doc. Thank you so much. Yeah, so we, we've known each other for a couple of years. I can't exactly remember the exact date. I remember where we were when we first spoke. Um, and we can get into that. But of course, today I want to hear a little bit about your journey and what you've learned as a coach and what we can do to help other coaches uh, and athletes as they're trying to grow and evolve and um, invest in other people. When you heard my definition of Max Out, put into words for us what your definition is. Okay, I thought about this. And again, I've listened to all the other podcasts, but for me, that resonates for me it is doing everything possible to achieve what you set out for exhausting all avenues, plan A through F, um, all your effort, all your, um, your tools that you have gained through the process or gained through, uh, whether it's, um, through relationships, through, um, textbook kind of plays or textbook kind of, uh, learning, uh, but you have exhausted all of it. You've double checked it. Uh, you've gotten advice. Uh, you've not just gone through little bits of it just with your group. You've expanded it all as well. Yeah, I love that. And it, it takes a lot of time and effort to find those inches. For those that don't know, I mean, at the NAIA level, it is phenomenal volleyball. It is extremely high volleyball, especially in the Midwest. And we're still trying to find inches here and there to where your teams can max out in sport and life. There are some people obviously who don't know you. So let's talk a little bit about your journey as a person leading up to the time when you first started to coach. I gave a little bit of a hint, but give us a sense of who you are and how you came into the coaching world. So um, is it okay if I start with even with volleyball? Like, Okay, uh, we'll, we'll go back. Um, so I'm born and raised uh, here in Omaha. Uh, I am an o- Omaha West Side graduate, which I think you're a warrior as well. Uh, class of 1995. Um, I didn't start playing volleyball until seventh grade. And that's when 
my family, my parents have said I, I, I changed <laughs> to the worse. <laughs> uh, one, loved volleyball, absolutely dove into it. I also played softball. I uh, did track in high school as well. Terrible at basketball, horrible at it. Um, but when I uh, was at Westside, I, I knew from the start I wanted to play. Um, my freshman year in high school, I actually was cut. Um, I did not make my first club team tryout, and that was devastating to me. So I could have either either stopped playing or, or went on. Um, I, I wanted to play. I found a league. Uh, my parents helped me find a league and still play, even though I, I cried for days uh, that I was cut. Um, so fast forward to, I think, senior year. So a fall of my senior season, I decided to um, to, I, I want to commit to a school. And I, I visited a lot of NCAA schools, uh, mostly division two. Um, and then, um, I had a, a school here in town that, uh, was an all women's college that I thought no way. Um, but I was, I was made an offer. Um, I was given an offer that I couldn't refuse that helped me and my family financially. Um, what was funny was, um, the club coach uh, coaches that um, cut me <laughs> were my college coaches. Uh, so that was pretty kind of neat story there. And um, so I went on uh, again, hundred percent. This is what I wanted to do. Um, I played at college St. Mary for four years. And then um, uh, after that, towards the end of my career, I thought, well, do I want to coach? Do I want to, work. Um, I was a graphic design major, so I knew I wanted to make money. I wanted to go on and, and get a job. And, um, and that just wasn't in the cards. I even remember sitting in my coach's office saying, I, I don't want to coach. Um, I liked it for a job uh, while I was in college, but I, I wasn't dove in quite yet. So I worked at, uh, at HDR, uh, Paysetter Corporation, um, and then I got a job at HDR as a graphic um, technician in the environmental group. And thumbs up to all those folks because it was an awesome group to <laughs> work around. Uh, a little bit different personalities where it was, didn't always fit mine. So I brought in that liveliness. <laughs> um, but uh, I worked there for a few years. College of St. Mary's job opened. Coach Gieselman was there and he went on to work at Creighton um, after that. So when that job opened, I thought, well, I'll apply. Um, I was 24 at the time. And when I applied, they came back and said, Trish, we, we want you to be here, but you're still a little bit too young and inexperienced. Uh, they hired another coach. That coach asked me to be his assistant. And this is still why I was at um, HDR. So I did both for a while. I, I said, yeah, I'll, I'll come on as a coach. And so I was driving back and forth. It was a lot on my plate. Uh, but a, a couple weeks into the season, I got a call saying that he was no longer going to be on staff. Um, so that was, again, only two weeks into the season. We're in mid-September. Um, and uh, they said, will you be interim? So I did interim and working full-time at HDR. And that took its toll on me quite a bit, but I, I, I knew, I'm like, gosh, I kind of like this now. Um, at the end of the year, uh, they, they asked me to stay on. We went 20 and one. We, went, we won 20 in a row. Uh, was upset at the end for our, the regional. Um, and I think at that point I said, I, I would like to, they asked me to come on as full time. Uh, so, that's kind of the start of how I got into it. It was a, it was a very tough financial decision uh, with my husband and I at the time um, because it was, a, it was a major pay cut and it was something that was scary. And, uh, but in the long run, I know it's um, the start of that has um, really evolved into, again, coaching career or whatever, which um, I can go on a little bit more about the playing, but I still played. I still, um, I, I haven't won a national championship as a player, a lot, a lot of conference championships. I was on the first 
um, team at College of St. Mary to make nationals, which is pretty cool. Um, and but I've won a national championship with two teams in my adult league, uh, adult days, and uh, played with a lot of Huskers, UNO, uh, Creighton, um, a lot of big names that are still in the volleyball world right now. And then I played doubles um, in some amateur sand and grass tournaments and won some major tournaments there. So um, I, I, I love the game. I love winning, <laughs> but I also know um, that my training and everything, you know, kind of brought me to that point as well. So. Yeah, I love that. So that's, I mean, <clears throat> we're hearing some common themes though, but it, what I love was that early on, you had a fork in the road, right? You got cut and you could have gone one of two ways, like a lot of people choose to do when they hit a bump in the road. And what was it about you, right, that led you to make a decision to go on the road of, I don't know, fuel motivation, I'm going to keep working at getting better at this versus I got cut from my team, so my I'm going to quit. It's too hard. You know, I, I think at that time, being an, um, a freshman in high school, um, my mindset wasn't blaming them. It was something like either they didn't see something or I wasn't prepared or, um, I mean, I was mad, um, but I thought I, I have to still play. Like, this isn't just going to define me right now. I, I still love the game. I still like doing this. And I don't want someone to tell me that I can't do it. Um, so I, thanks to my parents and everything, um, it was like an intramural league that I played in. It wasn't anything that, and I didn't even know what I was getting into when I was cut from club. I was like, hey, you're supposed to do this. Okay. <laughs> um, so I just knew I wanted to keep playing. Okay, fair enough. So jump forward to that year at College of St. Mary's where you became a coach. Um, and you'd win 20 in a row and you have this great season. I mean, did, did you have a brief period in your mindset where you think I've got this all figured out or um, like this is going to be pretty easy or what was your mindset after having a big run like that in your, in your debut? Yeah, um, I vaguely remember being very comfortable and not challenged. And here's why. Um, Throughout that first year, it, I wouldn't say criticism, comments. Comments were made, well, these are the previous coaches, recruits. Um, these are, this is his past success. Um, this is something that, you know, um, this is not you. And, and not in a mean way. It was just something that you know, and every time I heard that, I'm like, well, I'm showing up for practice. You know, I'm my staff and I is the same staff. This is I'm comfortable because this is my alma mater. I know how things work. This is what um, they were recruited by the same coach. So I can still deliver and almost I wouldn't say I was acting, but it was like I was mimicking everything to make it work because it wasn't broken either. So I didn't go in and make a bunch of changes I still kept that same philosophy. And um, I, I would say I made it my own. Obviously I'm a different person, but I had the same people that were on staff and we, we just didn't make a whole lot of changes. We, we kept it moving, we kept the train going. Um, but uh, the one thing that resonated and I still to this day remember someone saying, you, you do the work, you have to, it's all for you to screw up basically if, if, if that's the case. So um, I knew that I was doing a good job. I knew from, from people saying, no, you're, you're the one still doing the, the work and, and, and doing moving forward with that. So anyway, that was, that was something that um, after four years, when a job opportunity came up and Bellevue called, um, I wanted to make the jump um, there were some talks with Cotta St. Mary that I wanted to stay. Uh, we were a team that just um, made it to the Elite Eight and we had everyone back. And I thought, my gosh, this is an opportunity for to help my family financially if I were to move to Bellevue. Um, if you're a Red Sox and Yankees fan, you just don't, 
you don't get along. This was called a St. Mary in Bellevue. We, we, we beat Bellevue and we were always number one. And for me to leave and go to a team that's number two at such a high, and, and again, everyone back, I, I was nervous. I was scared. I wanted CSM to keep me, um, but they, they didn't have the, um, the negotiations to do that um, on what I was asking for to match Bellevue. So when Bellevue called, I took the job. I still had to see all those recruits because we played. It was awful. It was an awful first year at Bellevue. And then also trying to bring in a philosophy to Bellevue. And Bellevue was good. It wasn't like they were a bad team. They were still a, a top program as well. Again, going to Elite Eight themselves. Um, but it was like, this is what we're going to do now. And it was bringing in um, a, a whole new kind of uh, way of doing things when they did things pretty good too. Um, but it was, it was a scary feeling for sure. Um, going into a, a whole new program and, and trying to change things that I wasn't used to uh, because I was always used to being in a shadow. So, yeah. And one of the things that I think are, is underappreciated is consistency. And you've had a, uh, a career to this point that's been highly consistent. Um, yet we haven't won a national championship, like you said, but a highly consistent winning conference championships way more often than not. Being in the NEIA tournament, which is really hard. I don't remember the, the exact numbers, but it's like 15 out of 17 years in the tourney. Like most people would dream of having that consistency at what point along the way, as you evolved in your career at Bellevue, did you figure out, I'm pretty good at this? Um, let's see here. Uh, well, going back uh, to um, the, well, when I, before College of St. Mary, I was coaching at Duchenne High School. And when I came in, they were 0 and 25. So I'm like, hey, <laughs> all we can do is go up. Um, but their confidence that, that when I would came in and they're like, oh my gosh, I love these drills. I love the practices and those girls. It was a, it was a group of like, I think nine seniors. I could be wrong. Um, but the bond they had, I really enjoyed seeing that. And then... Um, and then when we won a match, it was the awesome, the best feeling ever seeing them because they're like, we haven't won a set. You know, it was, it was pretty awesome. But uh, I, I guess the other thing that then after that, knowing, okay, I think I can do this. Um, and then going 20 and one uh, was another one. Um, but I think the other defining moment was then again, that first year of Bellevue again, on, on my own, not on my own, but, um, you know, I, I'm now away from College of St. Mary Trish kind of thing. Um, it, it was the conference championship. Um, we were again, second to College of St. Mary. Again, all of the kids I were, I was in their living rooms. I was with their parents. I, I, I knew all those families and we came in and we did not even have a prayer. Like we had already lost twice during the regular season, come into the conference championship and we won in three sets, three sets. And it was unbelievable how great we played and how defeated that other side looked. And, and it, it was such a weird moment where I'm sitting with our team jumping up and down. I see my AD jumping up and down, which I thought, oh my gosh, he's going to die here. <laughs> he was going to, he was so excited to finally win, but I'm jumping up and down with the team. We're excited. We're high-fiving. And I look at the players that I also cared for, defeated, crying, and it was terrible. But the defining moment there was just, okay, I, I can do this. They're going to be okay. Okay. Here's this, here's my new family. And, um, and I thought I, I, I can move forward now and we, we got, we can do this. Yeah, I love that. So let me ask you this, <clears throat> and maybe it's changed. So if it has, I want to know this, but when, when we talk about a mission or your why, 
um, what is your what is your why, and has it has it changed over the years? Um, I think because I didn't always experience it as a player winning a national championship, but being in a conference championship, I mean, it's still a pretty big deal. I'm not down talking it at all. Um, but I, I was not a player that played, um, you know, under the lights with cameras and, and all that stuff. I didn't ever think I was going to be an Olympian <laughs> on that kind of uh, platform. But my why was always pretty simple. And I think what also helped me is I worked corporate for three years um, is that my why is just, I want players to love what I love. Uh, so even with my daughter now being 11 playing, I want her to love the game just as much, but I want her to, I want her to be a part of ready-made friends relationships when you get to be on a team and maybe they carry through a lifetime maybe they don't um but my why when i'm recruiting a player i want them to um, have a good time i want them to be happy i want them to play a sport that they love but also know it's going to stop someday and so the tools that we give them whether it's um holding them to time management or holding them to um, following up with folks on a text or an email or, or can you call someone and develop those relationships? I want life lessons to be learned through the sport of volleyball. And I think that's always been my why. Um, and uh, I mean, there's, there's times I was mad more about um, class than just winning a great big game the night before, like, Hey, you need to go to class, you know, and, and they might have had the best game of their life, but I'm here <laughs> talking to them about that. So I don't think that's ever changed. It's being responsible and, and um, young ladies that are going to be out in the working world. And, and maybe if they want to coach or if they want a great job, these are the things and tools you need. Yeah. So let me, has there been a shift at all? I, and the reason I say this, I, I just tweeted out a cool story on Oklahoma softball and kind of this coach who's been highly successful, but at a time she described back in the day where wins and losses used to define her in a way and the losses would just tear her up. And I can also remember um, uh, what drives winning conference with Brett Ledbetter, who's just one of the best in the business. He, he was talking to Mary Wise or they were talking about Mary Wise, the University of Florida coach for women's volleyball, who hasn't won a national championship either, but she had written a, a letter to her younger self. And it was all about, I wish I had had perspective earlier, that I wish that I didn't let the wins and losses define me as much and that, that the players didn't see that and it impacted me so much. So again, as you've gone through this journey as a very young coach, which is unusual to be in your mid twenties, to be a head coach of a, a big time program. And now you're in your forties uh, um, if I do the math right. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, has that, can you relate to that at all? The Oklahoma women's softball coach, the Florida women's volleyball coach, and, and the way wins and losses um, impacted them emotionally earlier in their careers. I was a crazy person. I was crazy. I would, I would think it was, you know, if someone played bad, not necessarily did on purpose, but like, what are you doing? That was, that was terrible. And, and it was, I did not take the ego out yet. Um, so I really had to do that. And there was, um, I think there was a point in time where I, I heard uh, another coach on a podcast say, I lost the team. And I think I lost the team because I was not taking my ego out um there was a little bit of both I wouldn't I, I mean I, I blame myself but there's some immature things that happened that I would say um didn't didn't fare well but um I I had to take the ego out and now I, I joke I say it but um it doesn't always happen but I come home 
And I say, you know what, after this game, I'm just going to go home and have a bowl of fruity pebbles, <laughs> you know, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to worry about it. We're, we're going to go back at it and, and we'll figure it out. Um, but I thought, oh my gosh, you know, someone's going to say something, the paper's going to say this or, or, you know, um, we're, we're bad. We're not going to make nationals. It's September. You know, what, why worry about that? I, I don't, I think I had to have three kids <laughs> of my own to settle myself down. And I've heard that in some other podcasts as well as my own children have had to, because I've had to rearrange my priorities. Um, I'd be at the office till, you know, I go in at nine o'clock in the morning when I didn't have kids, I'd say bye to my husband and come home at 11 because I was just in the office nonstop. I got to do this. I got to do this. And now I'm, I, I still do silly things where I think you've gotten emails at one in the morning or <laughs> two in the morning. I mean, my, my brain doesn't shut off, but at the same time, there are other things. And, and even the players seem to feel better where Trisha isn't down our throats all the time. She's not, um, she's not harping on these little things or whatever, but um, my identity hasn't changed. My role has changed. Um, I'm still competitive. I still want them to put these things in perspective, but I'm not going to, you know, throw a chair. I didn't, I didn't, <laughs> I'm not going to do these crazy things uh, that I knew I did back in the day, my body language, it was terrible. I, it, it, I think a lot of things that you've taught us over the years, I look back, I'm like, oh my gosh, if Doc would not even want to talk to us if he came back 10 years ago. <laughs> well, that's funny. So that great, that coach you were referring to that lost her team was Coach Booth from Creighton. She talked about it on the podcast about how she looked in the eyes of her team, you know, being very vulnerable and saying, I could tell they kind of checked out on me and she was still a relatively young coach. I think this was 2010 or 11 and had had quite a bit of relative success in growing Creighton from um, into a really talented program. And then she had a bump in the road and, and for some a number of reasons that she's discussed openly, she felt like she lost her team. And it was one of the, I think it was heartbreaking to actually in reflection, hear her talk about that, but yet, the growth that took place from there, it was the cool point. But I always ask the question, you know this, um, I always say, what's your contribution to the problem? And so you had briefly said, look, I have this setback there, you know, um, where I lost the team. There were some other factors, which there always are, just like a coach boost. There were factors that she didn't have control over. But then she really had to get into a situation of what's my contribution or role here? What do I have to do to change? so that I don't lose another team, right? And so I'm gonna ask that same question to you when you reflect on that particular team, what was your contribution to the problem in losing that team? And what did you do about it? Um, my choice words, um, things I would just get a short fuse on. Um, if I remember right, I was, uh, with my third kid. So as, as moms, parents, lack of sleep, stress, carting them all over the place, trying to, trying to fit everything in. And then you have a, a player that didn't follow directions and you, you fly off the handle. And even though they might've done something wrong, they don't always point blame at themselves. And then the coach gets heated. I mean, I think we've all been in that situation and now they point blame at you and then, and then chaos happens. Um, I, I wouldn't, it's not an excuse. It's something that I had to balance in my life. Um, but I would say again, um, I, I didn't make good professional des decisions to uh, in hindsight, looking back and how I could have handled it way better. Um, at the same time, uh, we had a group, it was a group of, um, graduated a huge uh, senior heavy group and then brought in um, like, gosh, I wanna say like 10 freshmen. We went 0 and 11 to start it off. <laughs> it was painful. And then won 11 in a row. And I wouldn't say it was anything that I changed. It just 
either clicked or they started knowing each other's names. <laughs> um, but it was, uh, I had I had to really step back after that. Um, and it was at the end of four years with a lot of that group. Uh, so it was four years of developing, just festering. And um, so I, I took a step back, um, went through some things um, with, with administrative things that, that helped uh, for sure and the support. Um, but it, it was a it was a it was a rough time, and I even have coaches that call me and say, Trish, what did you do? And I I feel like I, I'm I'm a, a good advocate for all that, but it, it's horrible. It's it's a devastating time as a coach when you you put your heart and soul to everything, and then someone's telling you you need to you need to change. And uh, at that point, like the fork in the road, you you can either go one way or the other way. And I. I chose, I want to, I want to do this still. I don't want to fix this. And cause I don't feel good when I go home. And, um, so again, more sleep, um, and then evaluating some things and the, the easy fix was something that I thought of that I I'm like, I, if I lost the team, we need to develop, they need to get to know me a little bit more because maybe they don't know me and what I go, maybe they think as soon as practice, I go home and I, I kick our dog or something and, and, and I'm mad and I'm still yelling or whatever. I'm not like that. And I wanted them to know me a little bit more. So we developed walk and talks and that was something where for just maybe once a week or, or even once a month with that one kid, which is still not a lot. Um, but we, we walk around, each coach takes time to walk around with that kid for about 15 minutes. We, we time it, alarm goes off. Um, but we got our steps in and stuff, but we talk with them. And, and honestly, I just ask questions. I try to, it's hard. Um, and they, they get to talk and they get to say what they want. It's not just about volleyball. It could be, Hey, how's your family doing? How's, how's class, you know, whatever you're going on vacation. You want to talk, tell a little bit about that. So it, it gave them their time. So where, when they come into practice, we have aggressive ones that come in and joke around or right away, we got to get started because we just got done from lunch and we, we need to get going because basketball is coming in. Um, there was a, there was a point in time where I looked, I'm like, I never, I didn't even say hi to that kid this week because she's just not a, she's not a quiet person, um, not a starter. So she wasn't on, you know, maybe this side of the court that I was on or, or whatever. Um, so there was a lot of changes that I thought they need to get to know us as human beings a little bit more, not just a threat all the time. Someone that just gives them constant criticism or constant feedback where they, they need to change. They need to change. And it was something that we had to, we had to really look, look through. Yeah. What was the outcome behavior of putting in the effort through walk and talks and other means to, uh, essentially build the relationship or getting to know each other? What was the outcome behaviors that you saw? Well, I will say in a lot of, again, with a lot of things with that, and then even going to drills back in the day, if the drill didn't get done right, like I thought we couldn't end the drill until we fixed it that day. And that was, it's silly to me. So going back through the process and everything, um, you know, in the matrix, he, you know, he puts a chip in and he's like, I know Kung Fu. <laughs> so that part we need to, I, I felt like we just need to grow. So the process with the walk and talks was slowly, if we called them out on something and, and not in a, you know, horrible way, they started to nod their head. They understood that there was still love there, that there was still, um, a, a relationship that they knew we were just pointing out something. It wasn't, you know, mean, it wasn't, something that they took personal right away. Um, it was something that um, we knew that they could do better. And um, hey, try this, or hey, um, I need you to be really um, you know, disciplined on this. Um, so it wasn't a, an immediate attack. It was, it was shown to provide help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you know, obviously I like to talk about the biggest challenge of a leader. One of them is being 
finding that healthy mixture of love and accountability. Right? And just listening without putting words in your mouth, I think there was a period of time there where you may have had both, but it was skewed more to the accountability side and very less to the love side. And, and when you said I started building the relationships and they saw more of the love relationship side, I can hold them more accountable. And they were more open to that feedback rather than just the coach who's always holding me accountable and criticizing or making corrections. We start to hear it differently when we know a person cares about us. Does that, does that resonate? I would say so, but body language tells a lot too. And so my words could have said something, but if I was eye rolling, if I was you know slumped in my chair, mm-hmm. all those things that we talked about earlier, um, it, it says a lot. Another coach that you'd said, you know, took a drink out of a water bottle. Oh boy, um, you know, I I stood up or I sit down. If I sat down, slunt, you know, hunched over or whatever, it was, you know, what she she's mad. She's mad now. Um, so those were things I had to, you know, kind of keep an eye on and, and make aware. So it wasn't just during the game. I had to be aware of myself too. Yeah. That awareness piece, right? We think about so many coaches get caught up in the X's and O's and all the drills and things we have to get right. And then under pressure, what are the, what do the athletes look towards for their coach? They look toward what's my coach's body language like? How are they communicating with me? How are they saying it rather than what are they saying? Especially women. Um, yes. And is the coach mad at me? Does she believe in me? Does she trust me? Um, or she, or he or she, and right? And it's not about the X's and O's, right? <clears throat> and that's gonna get me into a story that I have to ask you about in a little bit, but because um, it's it, it got into a fist set with one of the teams that I know well with you too, but um is it fair to say that that was your most discomfort as a coach then when we lost the team, we had some administrative things you referred to that you had to kind of work through to try to figure out how do I make some changes here so that one, I can stay on as a coach two maybe actually enjoy being a coach again. Um, was that the biggest period of discomfort that you've experienced? Horrible discomfort, almost a depression. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I, read these articles and and hear about these accusations for coaches and i'm not saying they're all innocent or or and i'm not either but um it's it's devastating and um i i feel really bad for those folks that either don't have support or don't have someone that um could vouch for them at that that's also another one um but uh it it's devastating So at what point during your evolution, um, either as a player or coach, did you start to figure out that mindset training was important or that mindset in general was an important factor in elevating performance for life and sport? Okay, so before I called you, I was just, again, it was really hard for you. I'm not buying it. I don't want to you know, get out my guitar and start, you know, strumming to the whole team and thinking all this. And, and I had to really do, um, Steve Field, my assistant, and I've had some awesome assistants currently and in the past. Um, they're, they're, I wouldn't say they're hesitant to tell me new ideas, but I, we, we have good conversations on it. And Steve's like, you got to call doc, you got to call Renee, Saunders and, and Renee and I have the same birthday so we have a bond she also uh hit the ball and knocked me out one time so we have a we have a major bond <laughs> in high school it's on video um but anyway uh he said Renee has a contact that I really think they, they got something they're obviously doing something right so I, I'm not above reaching out to a coach and saying and, and even an opponent saying mm-hmm. what are you doing and uh, cause I wanna, I wanna learn it too, or we wanna do that too. Um, so I called Renee, she gave me her number and, and that was where, um, when I did talk to you and I was in my driveway in my car, <laughs> um, asking about this. And the first thing you said is coach, you need to buy in. And that was, that was like, whoom, just shot right at me. Like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna have to change again. And I just was, <laughs> you know, went through a major change again. I'm like, 
okay, that means there might be criticism again from the team, or there might be things that the team wants that I have to change again. And I'm, I was nervous. I was really nervous that if I don't buy in, this isn't going to work. And I wanted it. I, I felt like we really needed to do it, but I wasn't for sure. Um, I didn't have mindset, mindset training. Again, that was just something that wasn't talked about back in the day. Mine was, I walked in and if I made a mistake, it was not my fault. <laughs> That was how I thought as a player, I, I could make 10 and I still was like, I'm, I'm still a player that contributes. So it was, it was a confidence that I had that um, I, I didn't know how to, that I'm like, Oh, this really helped or whatever. No coach yelled at me. And I, I went harder. Um, I did this. I, 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 I just was, was, uh, would walk out and, and be okay. Um but uh, I knew this group was a special group that I, I had talked to you about and, and said, I think we really need to do this. And when you said, you, you got to listen, you got to buy in, but you also have to keep working on it and you can't just do it when I do it. And so that resonated with me. And I, I think I, I made the commitment slowly. Um, but then now I know just from results alone that the team is better. I feel better. We all feel better regardless of the outcome because we've been working on these things. Yeah. So a couple of things, um, cause it is interesting, you know, and I think it's, it's a criticism of kind of the things that some people in my area do is we don't do a great job. I think always presenting kind of what we can do for a team or we people do really silly things and, I remember when I first met with the Creighton team about a decade ago, and they said, you're not going to make us play with a horse, are you? It was the very first night, and I said, how many of you want to be here? And like two raised their hand out of the whole group, and I said, I think that you two are lying, aren't you? Because you get to see it on them. And they said, well, I said, well, what's the hesitancy? They said, well, the last person made us pet a horse and do these weird things. And then and I can remember one of the gymnastics teams at Nebraska, we were working really hard on mindfulness stuff way before anyone else was, and they were crushing it. And one of the teams walked in at the Big Ten Championships and made a comment, uh, it was the Big 12 Championships, or Big Ten, and said, what are you guys doing, some kumbaya stuff? Because we were all there. Kumbaya. You know, this kind of stuff. And, you know, of course, our team wins the championship and they fall short. And I just remember thinking, um, you know, maybe have an open mind rather than criticize the team who's trying to do something. But that's... But I think also maybe we don't do a good job of maybe explaining what we can do, or we introduce something really strange at the wrong time before you build trust. So, um, so I mean, it's not unusual. I think the other piece is, is I have found a pattern of coaches who have, for whatever reason, naturally been confident or was able to work through setbacks, like you said, by working harder, or when a coach yelled, you just let it brush off that we have a hard time understanding why the kids we coach, when we coach them hard, don't handle it the same way I did because well, I handled it that way. So what's wrong with them, right? Did you experience that at all as a coach leading up to the time you called me because of your own background and wiring that it was more frustrating than maybe for others? Like why is somebody, I don't know, what were your thought processes when somebody didn't handle it the way you would have? Yeah, hundred percent. And, and I had to take a step back and they, they don't think like me, they don't think they don't, they didn't, they didn't, um, either same background or same parents or say, you know, they don't, they didn't think like me. And, um, either it was, I, I took it personal at the beginning. So 24 years, again, 24 years old, and I'm only a couple years older than them. Um, so, and again, females tend to be rubbed the wrong way with other females. Um, so that was a growth. And then I thought before I called you that I I'm getting older, <laughs> I'm not on the same level. I don't like the same bands. I don't like the same music. I don't like, you know, the same shows, vampire diaries, whatever. I, I, I had no connection on, on that kind of stuff, or, or I was seen as older. I, anytime they're like, oh, you're a mother to us. I'm like, nope, an aunt. I'm an aunt. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, 100% agree with that statement. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about, you said you can tell a difference with your team. 
Um, and there's a lot of reasons why a team has a better record, right? So I always say my role is small but significant, right? Relative to the hours that you put in, your athletes put in, your strength people put in, the hundreds of thousands of hours, even on a good year between all the things we do, it might be 10, 20, 30 hours of conversations and individual stuff and team stuff and me coming to games. So I say it's small, but I also say it's significant because every team will tell me that mental or mindset is a huge component of performance. So I don't want to discount it either. I uh, just don't like to be overcredited. But there's lots of reasons why teams do better than you know, other teams. And your team last year was the first team really in this new era to actually make the quarterfinals and, and, you know, reach a next level for Bellevue, right? Teams have been great the three, two or three years I've been around you. I get mixed up because of COVID because there were two years, but yeah. But can you put into words how you've noticed the impact of mindset training and working on team culture and chemistry issues? What do you observe in your team? So I think the, the main reason um, for that phone call to you was we aren't getting over the hump. We have the most talented teams year after year, talent-wise. Like if, if we were to be in gym class, gym class, a lot of coaches would be picking some of these kids. And I thought, you know, what are, what are we doing? We're, we're going up 2-0 and we're losing in five. We're going up, you know, we're up by eight and we're losing the set. Um, what is going on? And, and when we're either ranked high or we're, we were picked to win, or, you know, we're in a, we're in a environment that we, sh it's a, it's a gym. There's nobody in the gym or um, whatever we had, everything was in our favor. Um, why were we doing this? And, and, and again, I don't know, um, what exactly it was, but I, I think that we play calmer now um, with, based on the, the mindset, we're not trying to overthink things. We're not trying to change all of a sudden. And we didn't, but the, the players would think they had to change, um, get a little tight. Maybe their breathing is different now because they're, it's either routine or they've been uh, taught um, in this situation, this is why, but I think the, the main one and, and from experience with, um, with our, the team that I played in adult nationals and we won the national championship, Kirsten was setting actually, um, we, we got along, we, we loved each other. We built such a relationship from the ground up in vulnerable times and, um, uh, things that we have shared with each other that really, really put life in perspective. I think that really is the first one that comes to mind of what growth we've had. Um, the power of communication nowadays is not as good as it was. I, we did an exercise the other day where I wanted them to get to know each other. So the new players had to interview the older ones and the older and vice versa. They all texted each other. I, I think one called, but they all texted each other. In my mind, I thought, well, they'd call each other. Well, they didn't. And that was something that I'm like, oh, I just want them to be able to talk with each other because the power of the tone of your voice, the way you um, present it, and that goes back on the court too. If you you know, talk to a teammate on the court, your tone could be different. It can change a whole different, it could change the next play because you're upset about something or maybe it just wasn't communicated right. Um, another one that again, because of the, the, the way we love each other and care about each other is um, we've had a couple players always want, one's a caretaker. One wants to make sure everyone's good. Everyone's awesome. And another one is very hard on herself, uh, in, and which is not uncommon either with a lot of them. Um, but they wanted to fix each other. And for us, it's like, you don't need to. We're, we're good. Like, you guys are, are good. The way you guys communicate, don't try to fix each other throughout the whole match because it, it's just, it, it's not connecting that way. So I think... Um, through just little things on what do you need from me? We've talked about, I think that one's a huge one because some of them, um, 
another question that they said or worry that the team has that we broke down the walls on was I don't want to let my teammates down. And I said, <laughs> raise your hand if you are upset with so-and-so because she made an error. No one raised their hand. I'm like, okay, let's get rid of that one because it's it, it that's not something that happens with us. We're, we're good. We, we want, it's okay. We want you to take that risk. And so I think communication between the coaches and the players has been huge with having the no fear, um, being okay with making an error, especially if you're taking a risk. Um, we're okay when you do this. We're okay. The serving one was a big one, just a, a minuscule one. We all, we're okay. Make an error. I mean, you're not make an error, but you are allowed to make an error. We're not going to have body language if it's 14, 14 and you, you serve it long. It, you went for it. Um, so I, I think the communication and the understanding and the love is way outweighs a lot of things, but we've worked on that through the, the growth mindset. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I hear communication, love, vulnerability, right? Relationships, how we want to be talked to. Now, you never mentioned one technical volleyball skill. And that <laughs> is a pattern that I consistently have been harping on is that you have to have enough talent to be in the discussion to compete for a championship at whatever level we're talking, right? You have to have that. But it's not the talent that wins the championships. You have to have enough of it. It's the, it is all the non-technical skills of your sport. And that has been a common theme from the U.S. Women's National Team to Nebraska and Creighton to Bellevue and Concordia to every great high school team I'm around. When you really talk about the ingredients of championships, right? Scott Apiola Vista South last year, of course they had talent, but it was the other things that they worked on that allowed them to, I think, max out when it mattered the most, right? On occasion, you can probably win it all, not doing a great job on those things. It's very rare today because of parity. And it's very rare that there's a generational team that couldn't, that doesn't love each other, that doesn't know how to communicate, that finds a way to win. It's just so rare to happen anymore at any level. So I love that you didn't talk about we were a better serving team last year. We were a better passing team. Like we had better outside hitters. We have the center of the year. Like all those things are true, but those were the things that you've noticed different, right? So mm. um, what was the contribution of the coaches over the last couple seasons and in particularly last season, right? In seeing the outcomes that you want on the coach uh, on the players as well. What did you guys do better as a coaching staff that allowed them to be calmer, to be more confident, to be more fearless? Well, in one of the sessions that we had, I know um, there's sometimes almost all the time we've been in there. I think there was one time we weren't. Um, and those are ones that as a coach, when we walk into the locker room or, you know, wherever we've met, we're like, Oh boy, how's it going to go today? You know, what, what's going to be said. And, and, and we're excited, but at the same time, nervous, like we want everyone to be on the same page, but maybe we don't know as a coaching staff. So when we go in there, we're like, all right, we're, 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 we're ready to take it on. And there was a couple of times where again, in their own way, it was very kind. It was sincere. It was not, um, you know, in a, in a jerk way. Uh, they had said, we really need the, the coaches to either smile more, uh, body language, uh, when we make an error. Um, and then another one, and I don't know if we talked about it, but who, who does someone need to have more feedback from which coach, you know, can they relate to? So maybe it's not me. Maybe this player does not need me to come over to them after a mistake. It might be Steve or it might be Micah. Um, and that was hard because again, our intentions aren't malicious. Our intentions are, it's in the, in the moment, like, oh, we just missed that serve. And immediately, you know, you do this or you, you know, you kind of whatever. You have to be so stoic 
And I know that when we played Texas Wesleyan um, for the opening round, and it was it was a great draw. <laughs> it was like, I'm like, oh boy, I'm nervous. Um, I think you had said, Trish, the, the team needs you to smile more. And I'm like, doc, I got a mask on. Like this was full COVID time last spring. How do I do that? And you're like, you got with your eyes, your body language, you need to praise as soon as there's an error you need to be the first one to be again praising and that was something that I'm like I am not a cheerleader I'm not rah-rah um but I'll do it and I think it was 14th no it was 15 14 they had it and and we had just shanked one <laughs> bad I'm like oh we're done I'm like you know okay you know next one next one and and uh it was like a breath of like I could see that player look like okay I'm okay it, you know uh, her body language really shows when she's nervous mm -hmm. and um, you know next play uh, it just kind of worked um, I don't think I did anything by any means to change the outcome it was just something at that moment that's what they needed um, but you know, walking out of those meetings after a team says that again, you have a fork in a road, you can, you can go and complain and say, well, this is stupid. This is, why are they even asking that? This is so dumb. Or you can say, all right, that's what they need. Then we have to really hold each other accountable as a staff to do it. Yeah. And I think you guys did that better. Who wants to be criticized, even when it's not really a criticism, but who wants to hear that you know, I need you to do this better for me, right? Uh, or Captain Obvious. It's, it's obvious sometimes, but do, do you need to really tell me I'm doing this? I know I'm doing it. It's good because sometimes, and sometimes it's good because we don't have complete awareness that that body language or movement really impacts somebody that great. Remember, and we watched that video of Draymond Green talking to Steve Kerr about how he needed his coach's body language to get, be better. And they had built this ultimate trust where Draymond's like, hey, coach, we need you right now. We're making some turnovers. We, we want to fix it and we're trying, but we look over to you and he says, it looks like someone died. Yeah. And it was interesting because you're talking professionals at the highest level, some of the greatest players and coaches. And that happens because we're human. Sometimes Steve Kerr, to his credit, said, you know, I was pouting. You know, I was frustrated. And he said, I was kind of ashamed now thinking about it because it wasn't my best moment. And I realized, thank goodness he said something to me because I realized my team needs me out there. And of course, we're human and are going to have those responses. But sometimes we think that it doesn't impact our players. And we have, I always tell coaches, you can keep doing what you're doing, but the outcome is less confidence, more fear. Or you can say, all right, of course, I'm not going to go, hey, great job. You hit it 30 feet long, but it's about the reaction to go, okay, hey, you know, or give them a correction. Hey, you dropped your shoulder or, hey, that was a great swing. Do it again. Like maybe it was a great swing, but it went a little long, but they were following the game plan. It just went long. It happens. Mm -hmm. Like come back at it. And, you know, I can remember in that match, <clears throat> an athlete in particular, and, you know, was E. Fountain, your outside hitter. And she had made an error in that game late. It was, and she was going for it. And, and she was a true freshman, you know, that year. And, but her growth, watching her take that next swing and then her next swing. And she was one of many reasons why that team came back from a, a dark period in set five to advance in the tournament, right? And sometimes it's a point here, a point there, but I think she had grown to be able to take big swings in part because of the way her teammates talked to her and the way her coaches responded to her. And um, that's just an observation I had watching her play that was so cool because sometimes we make a mistake and we don't take a big swing the next time because we think our teammates are mad at us or my coach is bad. I'm just going to play it safe and tip it, even though I'm great with tipping for strategy. But if we're tipping out of fear or to not make a mistake, that's a terrible reason, right? Right. I do think that's a great growth period that all of you had as coaches and um, you have a fork in the road. You get to decide, right? What impact does somebody like Steve have in your team? Not every coaching staff has an assistant who's been around as long coach Booth has had Angie for 20 years and maybe not quite that number, but I think close. And, you know, some of the great Nebraska football teams way back, 
they had the consistency in coaching staffs. And that's really hard today because of the way coaching staffs move and evolve and elevate. And sometimes money's involved in the highest levels where you don't stay together. What impact has Steve had in your program and in the consistency of having him around you? Steve is, Steve's my work husband. <laughs> Steve is um, glass, always full kind of guy. Um, very patient, competitive. Um, I, you'll have to ask a player what really draws to him. But what he does is when, when you talk with him, he has, he is giving you all of his attention. He is listening to you. He takes it all in. Um, he definitely asks questions like, because he's engaging with you. Um, he has some ideas that are just, I, I mean, they're, they're so intelligent sometimes on, on, on times where you're like, oh my gosh. And then you, you look and you're like, you're right. Um, he is, uh, again, someone that um, if we are down, he is, he is one that I would say would be great to go over and talk to because he's going to give you maybe not only technical, but how do you feel? How do you, um, and, and kind of get into something that, and that he can help with a little bit more. And you're going to go back out on the court and you're going to feel good for the next couple points, not the way you felt before you came off. Um, but he's also consistent. He, he's, uh, for what he has done in his life, you would think he'd be just dragging himself into work every day or um, negative on, on things. But he is so positive and he is the consistent uh, mood, consistent mood all the time. You know you're getting Steve like this every single day. You might get Trish like this. You might get Trish mad some day. You might get Trish happy some day. Um, but Steve is always going to be consistent. He he's reliable for that. Um, with that for the team for the for the young ladies that see that. Yeah, the consistency, the modeling of behaviors, right, mm -hmm. is really cool stuff. So, I want to take you back to one game last season that was an aha moment for me with your team, and it's only because one of your athletes had texted me this and it was against the team as you know I have great respect for that I know well as Concordia I don't think you had beat them in a while but it was a five set match on the road and um, your team is I think behind in set five as well um, but you went on to win that tough battle right and one of your athletes texted me about what happened in set five right do you do you have a recollection of what the athlete or what you guys um, did it at five during timeouts that might have been different than normal? If not, I will share with you. I, think, I think we we did a we we did a breathing exercise. Yeah, I mean, what the athlete told me is that usually coach in the past would just get upset, not obsessive, but really get focused on X's and O's. Yeah. You know, especially if we were behind in set five. And she said we were behind a couple different times in timeouts in set five, and coaches did no strategy. They only had us focus on our breathing and what we were thinking. Like no X's and O's at all. She, she said, I've never been in a huddle with coach in a set five where there were no X's and O's. Just let's breathe, let's calm down. We got this, let's go back out there. And, you know, it didn't mean you were going to win set five. You can right. do everything and, and, and you still can lose, right? I mean, it's a 50-50 battle, maybe even less since you were behind when you called the timeout. But I thought that was sort of a, really an evolution in that moment that you knew what your team needed and it was the non-technical skills of your sport and strategy is not what they needed in that moment I don't know how you knew that or how it came about now in my mind do you have any recollection of why you chose to have the team uh, breathe and um, be mindful of what their thoughts were rather than get out the clipboard and drop a play right I, th I think um, and again, vaguely remember, because I know we played them again this year and it went five too. So I, I think the, the last year's one was, 
it was almost like the wheels were coming off the train, like at that point, like, oh boy, shoot. And, uh, but I'm like, okay, we have to think positively, like volleyball is a game of momentum. Anything can happen. Like miracles can happen. Volleyball momentum can happen. So I think at that point, there is nothing like platform here, pass the ball, whatever. Um, we just needed to go. There's, there's nothing that, um, you know, if we designated something, uh, a goal in mind and it failed, uh, you know, it didn't work. Um, so I, I think uh, just remembering to slow their heart rate down because everything's just kind of piling up. That's all I remember. Yeah, I, <laughs> I think earth shattering, but I do. <laughs> earth shattering, which is what's really cool about it, right? Yeah. It shows a different strategy in that moment based on probably what you were observing with them, right? 30 year old Trish. Oh, payoffs <laughs> going on in set five. The rails are coming off. Oh, yeah. Are not we, Let's not go we, there. Are we hearing, um, I have to think positive, miracles can happen. We can just go out and do this. What would be going on in our younger self's brain? That not good. Again, that that was it wasn't someone I have to bury. Mm -hmm. Um because I mean again, I, I have no regrets. I, I I it happened. I have no regrets on things, but it was a behavior that um it just was it was it was something how I played. It was I was a feisty player. I was um probably wasn't a good teammate. <laughs> I know I wasn't, you know, if you weren't a starter, you're just on my team. It was terrible. I, I was not, um, I don't think I was a good person. And, and, and now, um, I, I, with some of the things that, um, I've said, and even some alums were like, oh my gosh, Trish, we watched you in that game, or we watched you in this game, we're just waiting for it. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, and, and if you remember, there was a, there was a coach at Westside back in the day that if you went to the game, all you did was watch the coach, because if you knew the Bane popped out, mm -hmm. it's going to be awesome. You know, we're going to get fireworks and it doesn't matter what the game's going on. We're just going to watch the coach. I think that's, I didn't want to mimic that, but again, it was something that I learned. I saw because that everyone loved that kind of behavior, not Bobby Knight, but it was just Mm -hmm. feisty you know and you got the best out of the players um at least you thought you did you didn't know what happened when they went back home mm -hmm. or you know what they felt but um so anyway that was that's not good Trish <laughs> but you know what the, the cool part is is that most people have had a stage not everybody but have had possible you know some people have had stages like that and or are still in that in that mode and to maybe hear a coach evolve, right? Because I've had other coaches obviously come on and have to evolve as well. And we've heard from Coach John Cook and how he had to evolve, right? We've heard from Coach Booth how she had to evolve. They were different evolutions, but we can't stay the same. And so, I, like I said, yeah, there's no, like you said, it's, you wouldn't take it back. It's what you were. The question is, is what do you do about it, right? And yeah. I, that's the cool piece of it all is that I think it did help translate into your team, um, especially under pressure, you know, leaving it all out there in a way that was more fearless in nature, right? So, and, and as you get to the end of last season where you did make history, right? And to me, that's, I want the teams to get to the end of the season and not want to take their jerseys off. People know that about me. I like that they love each other to the point like we'd give anything to continue to play with each other. That's cool to me. When yes. reach your goal or not, um, get to the end of the season and have no regrets because I can look myself in the mirror and my teammates and I and go, I didn't cheat this process. I did what I said I would do. I have no regrets. I feel bad that we didn't win or I feel great that we are holding the trophy, but I don't have any regrets as a player and as a team because collectively and individually, we did what we said we were going to do, right? And so I love those two things, right? But then I also love teams that make history, whatever making history looks like for them. Because like you said, when that team won its first game at Duchenne, you know, that was in a sense making history for that team. You know, it can be winning one game if you've ever won one, or it can be advancing to the quarterfinals like your team did last year and had that breakthrough moment where they'd been close before in recent years. 
why do you think this team, last year's team, was able to make the breakthrough under pressure and get to the Elite Eight and then have an all-out battle really to continue to, you know, it, it compete against the top team in the country and put some scare into them? Why were they able to do it? Uh, a lot of growing up. I remember a few things that happened. Um, the previous year, um, we did we did great, but we we lost um, to Park, and then uh, we lost to Dort. Okay, and then the Dort between the Dort, sorry, between the Park and the Dort game, there was something that happened, and it was um, a conversation that team said, "Coaches, go get the vans." And before before we have to come back, we need to talk. And there was a there was a team meeting, and, I, and when you leave that that room, you're like, oh gosh, not today, not today. <laughs> As coaches, you re, you walk away, and you're just like your feet are numb. Mm -hmm. um, but when we came back, we're like, you know, didn't didn't ask them, didn't didn't approach. They're like, we're good. I'm like, okay. But later we did ask, and we played awesome just fell short again. Um, the, there was a, a conversation where we needed to stop being perfect. Stop being perfect. Like team brought it up because it was affecting everyone. We're like, we are okay when you do this. Okay, so more details, but we'll, we'll, we'll move on from there. So then come this season, that was better. And, and that one player made the change where she was, she didn't just, and she could have cried in that meeting. She didn't, she, she accepted. And that would, I would say to any team, if there is a player that you, you almost like pick on, but for good, I hope that player does make a change and understand that it's, that's love coming. I hope they address it correctly, which our team must have. Um, but she made an impact on the team for the following year to where it was like, this is great. Like we are all here. So in the middle of the year, this past season, we didn't do too hot. We, we were out in Phoenix and we were in a position where we were up, we were up, we were up and we lost it in the last second. It's like, oh my gosh, what we're working on isn't something that um, we had set out to do again. So we had the growth and then we just took a big step back. And um, there was a, a few things. It wasn't just one thing. It was uh, one player really struggling, um, trying to, again, try and be perfect. Um, but it was a different one, a different one. <laughs> um, so there's a, there's definitely a theme with our, with our, with our team on this. Um, I know one feedback and, and they, they wrote it on their wrist of being just good enough and, and be consistently good. You don't have to be highs on, you know, highs up here all the time. You just have to be consistently good. So maybe taking off a little bit on the next, not taking off, but being smart with your shot and handling it and but being, um, you know, uh, with force and with aggressiveness on the next one or whatever. Um, but, but just being consistently good. Um, I, I think then getting to the end of the year, um, we didn't make a big deal about our loss. We're like, this is this, we needed, this is what we had to happen. We didn't want to be, you know, cocky now to where, Oh, we got it in the bag. And, um, that was, it was almost like a, a good learning lesson at that point in the year. Um, we did have a couple other, we weren't perfect uh, record or by any means, but um, a team that definitely challenged us is a couple teams in our conference. And what I love playing in that match against our, our top team in our, in our program is that we just keep our composure and I think that um, really helps or helped at the national tournament is keeping the composure, the hype. I mean, it's a whole nother level when you're at nationals, but we didn't get into the, the, um, the drama of that game where, you know, oh my gosh, this player and this player, whatever. When, when, if we were to, when we did lose to those teams um, in our conference or, or whatever, we knew why we discussed it. Um, the team discussed it more. Um, and then they always knew 
that they believed in themselves to 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 make it happen for next time or, or whatever like they didn't say we got outplayed like that defeat was not in their minds um some of them even said i did not play well i, I wasn't my best today um so when we got to that um that match at, at the elite eight, uh, final eight is what we nai calls it i think even in the third set because i think it went four against corbin yeah four <laughs> we played terrible it was like night and day on that that set and um again going back to the huddle and again we don't have to be perfect we don't have to we are good enough in the composure the smiles the, the huddle got a lot tighter um i i think that was those are a lot of learning lessons though so it kind of went all in one <laughs> it wasn't perfect it wasn't a a great match and then even on to the when we had to play in the quarterfinals they were there was no tears they were mad they were they're hungry still because um i think we're not going to cap ourselves anymore we're not going to just say get to here we we have the belief that um that they can play they can hang they're just that close uh so that's i think a really neat thing for our program is um we we would look at a team like oh boy that's that team that they're good and we're, we're, we're talking it out loud saying that we, we can be in, included in that group. That's hard to do. Yeah, that's cool. So many nuggets there too, but we're yeah. talking about like just being good enough, right? And what's cool is this for me, you know, because I like to show videos to teams and that really came out of Justine Wong Arantes podcast where she struggled with perfectionism and her own vulnerability in the podcast allow some of your ladies to be vulnerable and put good enough on their wristbands or their wrists or initials GE. I remember one of your athletes and it reminded them and they, it resonated, right? So you can say things, sometimes I can say them, but boy, Justine, the libero of the U.S. Women's National Team, you know, gets cut a year before, almost quits her sport due to perfectionism. And she said, thank goodness, Karch was working with me one-on-one and one. kept saying, you don't have to be perfect. You just have to be good enough consistently over time and for a couple of your athletes who needed to hear that they needed to hear it from her right it was more powerful from her than from you or for me even though we've talked about it that closed the deal and so that was really cool for me when I could see it resonate and like you said then this other stuff about staying composed because it goes back to my definition of maxing out giving all the things you have right can you max out reach the limits of your capabilities, but then can you do it under pressure when it matters? And there's a couple teams that we know of, right? They can't do it under pressure. They can win at a high level. They can win championships. They can win individual matches. But when we get to the true one and done, we win this game, we advance, we lose this game, we don't. There are some teams that can't stay composed. And I believe it's because the coaches don't model the right behaviors. The kids haven't really built the relationship. So under stress, their huddles break apart. You mentioned your huddles get tighter. Of course, you know that brings a smile to my face because that's something I, is at my core is tight huddles under stress. Um, and so that's really a cool thing, right? Because um, it's the key to having a chance to win at that level. And then- yeah. it, crosses mm -hmm. over into belief at some point, which is, I actually can believe we can play with anybody. I don't look at the jersey and go, oh my gosh, that's so-and-so we're beat, right? Mm -hmm. uh, no, we know what we can do. Um, we can get beat terribly in a set, come right back and win the next set, no big deal anymore, right? And so there's just been so much growth that starts at the top, right? I always say sometimes coaches get overcredited, sometimes they get undercredited, right? We certainly take the blame for a lot of things, but your evolution and your willingness, I think, to trust the process, right? Because a few different times, even today, you're still like, oh boy, what's going to happen in that meeting today, right? And then almost every time, thank goodness, we come out with life lessons or learning lessons that have made the team better, whether it's been their own team meeting, a collective meeting that you're involved in with us, occasional ones where you weren't involved, but it was with me or their own meetings, like it's, that process has now shown you 
that benefit comes out of it when there's a foundation of love and trust and that you trust the ladies now to go when we need to have our own meeting in the locker room we're gonna be good like we're not gonna come out and go all oh, great you know that that just made it 10 times worse right we needed to be in there with them to control the situation and monitor they know what to do now right and that's a really cool thing so and and it had to start at the top with you going I might have to change again I might have to buy in uh, to something that I think it could help but I don't know I certainly don't want any guitar playing right <laughs> I'm terrible at it <laughs> all right We've, we've, you know, talked a lot about a lot of things today and your vulnerability has stood out in the things that you need to do improve on, the things you have improved on. Where do we go from here? What do you want to see from your, your team, your coaching staff, you, that's, uh, what do you want to see going forward? Well, um, again, this isn't a magic answer. Obviously, um, making it to the national championship, the, the final, the big, the, the big one, not just the big dance, but the finals. Um, we were two matches away from it last year. Um, and th this might be something completely than an answer that you were expecting maybe, but um, with, with COVID last year, um, we went almost for a year and a half solid. So once the season was done, we took a break and we literally didn't have them like until March. We'll see you March 14th. So end of, uh, beginning of December to March 14th, they loved that break. And, and, and we were pretty happy that we, we were able to do that for them. Um, come spring, we just went through six or seven weeks, I think. Um, but that lingering of, of, of a uh, tough, like just mental drain is still lingering. And so my worry, and this might be a worry of a lot of coaches is still, are we okay? Are we still okay? And are we, are we doing what, um, uh, what is best for, for those that are still struggling, burnt out, um, trying to get their schoolwork done, you know, a lot of other things. Um, and at the same time, still maintaining on a path to preparing us um, for the fall. Um, we're trying to do a little bit more fun stuff. So journals, uh, fun journals, things that they want, they can communicate with us a little bit more. Um, playing some sand volleyball, so a different environment. Um, but my, I, I'm, I'm still very concerned about some of the, the kiddos on our team. And I, I hear it from a lot of coaches of are we going to be okay? Are we are, are we really going to be okay? Is this something that um, uh, it, it, not too much? Because I I, I mean I, I don't want to say life goes on, um, but we, how can we still be okay and in a in a good role model and a a coach? Like we have to coach through a lot of things, not just volleyball. A coach, how do we help them in a way with a plan, with a means of of every tool possible for them to still be successful if they're not doing too hot yeah i think that's a really <clears throat> fair and honest answer isn't it and, a, and, an, and an evolved answer because a lot of coaches would have left it with of course we want to get to the final game right and that's cool but i already know without a doubt that you would rather fall short of the final game and have a mentally well team then get to that final game and have some kids who have really fallen off in a very dark and bad way. Yeah. And you know, it's just a conversation we're trying to have more of, right? We had a big conversation, just you and I on the phone about this last week, because there are kids in struggle, not just at your university, but everywhere. And obviously multiple NCAA kids have committed suicide in the high school level and has been impacted greatly in Nebraska just recently with a couple very difficult uh, suicides in, in the Omaha area. And um, there's not an easy answer for it other than what you just said, which is trying to be mindful about it, give people tools, be aware, keep thinking about it and talking about it every day and make it a priority to talk about mental health. And, you know, we've been doing that for a long time anyway with teams, because I always say my goal is for people to 
in my goal is to have the shame and stigma reduced to such a point that people are okay getting help, right? Because if they hurt their knee, all in on getting help. You have a brain injury, going through a tough time, depression, anxiety, life issue. Um, don't want to tell anyone about it. Put on a happy face until I can't and, um, and not get help because I'm ashamed or I think my coaches will be will treat me different. My team will treat me different. And so you just bringing that up today allows people as we're wrapping things up today to be thinking, what can I do for my team every day? Right. That should be our priority. What does my team need from me? How can I help them with their mental health? How can I be, you know, and I still want to prepare them because sports important too, to both mental and physical health. It's what we do. No shame in saying I want to win it all too, but I want to take care of my kiddos. Right. And that's an evolved coach versus, you know, of course I want my kids to do fine, but man, we got to find a way to win. And yeah. I'm going to push them this hard. And if they break a little bit, I'll just have to, they won't be a starter. You know, they won't be able to play for me. And there are coaches out there who, do believe that in silence that um, it's okay if I break a few people along the way if we can get the outcome we want. And um, um, it's a challenging time. It's not going, you know, society, politics, you know, COVID lingering, lots of things are making this a very distressful period for 15 to 20 year olds, 22 year olds, and um, the adults of the world as well, right? So always being mindful that coaches got to take care of themselves as well. Uh, and that's yeah. hard to do, right? And you mentioned all the different pieces you have in your life. Um, so let me ask you this, just in the family piece before we wrap up, you mentioned your kiddos. What, what role does your husband play in you being able to do what you need to do for your team? Because you have a bunch of new kids every year on top of your own three. Um, what, is your, what, what, is your, what does your husband do for you? Ooh. If I say too much, they might have an ego in the house here. <laughs> that balance. Uh, well, he's a firefighter. So we have a uh, relationship where he is gone half the time um, for a full day. Um, it takes a village. We would not have been able to do this without our families, both being in town. Um, I know I see some other um, coaches needing nannies and stuff like that. We haven't had to do that we've had sitters we've had folks that have helped us and it's been awesome and thank you to all of those folks that have happened uh helped us and, and especially our parents and and our um our siblings and um you know he is i met him playing volleyball so he knows he's just as competitive we actually played doubles and uh i know there was one tournament we won we won <laughs> And the tournament director came out and said, you two shouldn't play anymore. <laughs> and I mean, he, he even said, I used to play with my wife and, and we can't do it anymore, but you guys, you guys are good together. You shouldn't play with each other anymore. Um, so recently we had a scrimmage and I had a lot of these former outstanding guy players back in the day in their prime. They were way better than Tom Cruise on Top Gun, <laughs> but they they came in and did a fundraiser for us. They played against our players. So it was a really neat situation. And we actually had two dads that used to play uh, one in college against their daughters. And that was really neat to say, I played against my daughter's college team and I'm 50 years old, you know, um, Mike, Mike said, uh, he, he's very supportive. He I'll come home. We'll talk about the game or, you guys need to do this, this. I'm like, all right, you know. Um, but one thing that he he said is they don't understand how awesome this is. I go, well, maybe they do. He goes, they don't understand how awesome this thing that they get to play in college is. They get to practice. They get to play every day. They get to do this. I'm like, yeah, but it's still a lot. He's like, I would have loved to have done that. But, you know, I know he's in a different situation men boys volleyball wasn't around you know kind of thing that was here in around, around Nebraska but um he sees talent he sees personality he gets to see all that as a fan and then and then come home and hear more about it through me and he just thinks it's the coolest thing ever so 
to have his support. We run around crazy around here. We high five, you know, <laughs> see you later. I know in August I'm gone for literally 16 days in a row. I think it's, it's not good because we're also moving my son to college uh, around volleyball season. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a team um, parenting. It's like a team. We got to be on the same page. If we disagree, we got to not do it in front of the kids as much as we can. <laughs> um, but it's really hard. It's, it, it's, uh, it's the hardest thing ever. And I laugh with this coaching stuff because we've, we get to see the, you know, the breakups of players on, you know, this boyfriend broke up, but we get to hear all that stuff. And when we, uh, as a, as a, a partnership between Mike and I, it's, um, you know, we're like, those are, those are silly compared to what we're doing now. <laughs> Uh, but very supportive, uh, love, loves to hear about all these great stories. Um, I'm in charge of the uh, Hall of Fame here at, at Bellevue with the assist, uh, assistant AD job. And, and uh, I had him in tears. He came and got to hear all these stories and all these folks that have been out for 20, 30 years talking about what their coaches meant and everything. And he's, he's like, I, I get it. I get it now. And I know why you do it. And I know why all of you guys do it because it's not about the money. It's not about all that stuff, but it's about the relationships and, you know, money's good though, <laughs> but um, it's uh, he, he gets it. And that was, that was a huge, like I even cried because I'm like, you get it finally <laughs> why I do all this stuff. So it's neat. It's a, it's a, an exhausting job. Um, with with the parenting and, and and travel um and then add a firefighter on top of that um but yeah he's my best friend that's so cool so cool all right so i've <clears throat> asked you a lot of things today is there anything else on your mind that you want to share that i um didn't remember to ask you about or didn't think about um no i i, I mean i think uh the 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 caliber of play here in Nebraska is awesome. Um, we love having Nebraska and border Iowa kids on our, in our program. Um, I think it's very hard to recruit. It's getting harder to recruit because a lot of these kids are going out of state and, and going to those programs, but it, it's, it's great volleyball. It's, it's so awesome. And I, I think for anyone that is uh, being recruited right now, um, please look at all levels, all levels of volleyball, because there's a small portion that get to enjoy and, and be a part of the, the elite uh, of, of division one and whatnot. So do do your homework and, and really look at all of that, but definitely look into, again, the coaching staff and what are they doing so that you do have a, a good career in college and, and that uh, coincides financially, mental health, all that stuff, especially for your career. So yeah, it's a, uh, it's a good gig. Um, and as far as uh, coaches that are struggling and, and knowing what to do on how to reach their team, my best advice is to network with, with other coaches and, and learn from them because maybe you might pick up on something uh, that will help you in, in your own uh, life as well. I love that stuff. <clears throat> you know, from my review uh, overview of things, you know, I'm lucky to be around a lot of great teams. I love coaches that are willing to evolve, even when they've been highly successful, um, because we have to in this world. But, you know, I don't have, I don't play favorites with teams, but there are some teams that I make, you know, just in life, you make better connections with. And, you know, Bellevue University, that, that group of ladies, the last couple of years, I would say, is at the very top of the connection list. Of oh, thank you. Um, thank you. You're, yeah, you're a part of our family too, Doc. <laughs> just so quick to embrace um, all this stuff. And, um, and I love that they've grown from it, but it's just a, it's a humble, hardworking group of ladies that you bring to Bellevue University and um, they're fighters, they're scrappy. They probably mimic you a little bit in that way. But I mean, I've, the growth that I've seen from them, the work that they put in on their own is what's really cool. And, 
you know, there a lot of them are going to go into really cool things after volleyball. And uh, isn't that a part of what we're trying to do here? So I really appreciate you being on the podcast. Thank you. I get to do, I got to do it. Yay. <laughs> Hey, and we will um, we will be in touch soon. Thank you so much for being on the Max Out Mindset podcast. Thank you, Doc. Thank you. You're welcome. Physical abilities are rarely what separate the greatest of athletes. Quite often, it's their mindset. The best in their respective sports are defined by how they approach and how they perform in the biggest moments. Do you wish you could train your mind so you're more confident, composed in those moments? Neurofuel was created for this very reason. Neurofuel is a mental training app designed to maximize performance in volleyball athletes. The app provides resources for athletes at all levels to develop their mental skills so you can perform your best on and off the court when it matters most. If you're curious, please head over to www.neuro-fuel.com. That's www.neuro-fuel.com for more information. And for Max Out Mindset listeners, we're offering a discount. Use the code MAXOUT10, that's CAPS, M-A-X-O-U-T, 10, with no spaces, at checkout and enjoy a 10% discount. We look forward to helping you reach your full potential. Max Out Mindset is powered by Performance Mountain, helping people reach their peak in business, sports, and life. Begin the climb today. At Performance Mountain, we've worked our entire lives to be elite in every sector. Now we try to give back. At Performance Mountain, we empower teams and groups to maximize potential, minimize friction points between groups of people, communicate at the speed of trust, and optimize performance when it matters most. Check us out at performancemountain.com.